So Patty Pimlet and Tony Ferguson are going at it. UFC 296. It's official. If you guys think I'm making that up, I'm not. See, look at that. Uh, I'm sure you guys have already heard about it anyway. But I want to talk about this fight specifically because there's a lot that went into making this match, right? So when fights get made, usually it's pretty straightforward. Either the two guys have some kind of conflict that you can market the fight around and they're both asking to fight and it makes sense and so they make the fight. Or if there's no conflict to be made, and that usually is the case, there's not normally a conflict, then they do it based on the rankings, right? This person is getting close to a title shot, so give him someone in the top three. This person is, you know, outside the top 15. He's won three in a row in, you know, spectacular fashion. Put him up against number 12. Let's see how he does. Like, stuff like that. You know, like, those are kind of like the basic reasons that matches get made. When you get up to title shots, obviously a person's marketability is going to impact the likelihood that they are given a title shot immensely. But nonetheless, that is the general framework for why fights get made. When you get to a fight that has like seven layers of depth for why this fight is specifically being made, I love it because I get to talk about it and I find this kind of thing fascinating because this is an absolutely perfect match. Perfect perfect matchup for a lot of different reasons and I'm going to tell you guys exactly what those are and I'll tell you exactly what these guys were thinking going in on both sides but like I said uh as a framework uh I'm actually I'm not sure if I said this yet but we're going to look at uh some of Beige Frequency's documentary that he did about Tony Ferguson uh really 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 solid I mean you know Beige Frequency always does awesome videos but this one was great really well researched and uh I learned some stuff about the struggles Tony's had mentally that I did not know about. Like I knew, you know, like I knew that he had had these, you know, the the wife filed a restraining order and, you know, she's worried for his mental health and all that stuff. Like I, I knew about that. I didn't know the details. I didn't know the exact things that happened according to police reports, according to the wife. And now that I do, it changes things. It's, uh, it's much more serious than I realized. And my instincts about what's going on behind the scenes with Tony Ferguson are not only validated, I would say they're enhanced immensely. And I bring that up and I'm not doing it to like, to, you know, pile on Tony or anything like that. It's just like, it just, this goes directly into why this match was made. And that's just what it is, dude. So, Uh, if you have not subscribed to the channel yet, I would appreciate it if you did, because if you don't, then guess what, dude, I might come up in your house and start staring in your refrigerator and telling you that people are recording me in your fridge because I'm the second coming of Jesus. What? That sounds weird. Oh, I wonder if that's foreshadowing for what Tony did. Maybe. But anyway, yeah, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Click the button. Oh, also, seriously, all my subscribers, if you would click like, that would be amazing. Just boop. If I don't ask, people don't do it, you know? Anyway, all right, let's rock and roll. So uh, this is on. This is not what I was going to show you. I want to show you this first, just so you get kind of a framework for... Honestly, I really just want to share this with you to make sure that you guys know about this and then also recommend Base Frequency's channel for the 100th time. Um, and then we're going to get into the match, you know, like why they made this fight. And then we'll talk about the fight breakdown, which also goes into all of it. All right, let's rock. Very alarming. In the documents for a court filing obtained by MMAfighting.com, Mrs. Ferguson made several claims that provided more details on the events leading up to her decision to pursue a restraining order. Christina claimed that on February 5th, Tony didn't sleep because he believed there would be a great flood as a result of a lunar eclipse. Tony allegedly purchased a life raft and drove Christina and their son to Palm Desert, California, about 111 miles inland from their house. At this new location, she said Tony woke her and their son up in the middle of the night and said that they had to leave because they were not safe. She added that Tony promised to seek help for his mental issues if there was no flood, but later refused. Okay, so I'm going to pause it right there just to say I am obviously not a licensed psychiatrist and I am in no position to diagnose people, you know, just off of stories. But from what I hear from these stories is that Tony is either diagnosed, is either undiagnosed or diagnosed and we don't know about it, schizophrenic. Okay, like that's, that's, that's what I take from this is uh, he sounds, from what I've read about schizophrenia, this is very much what it sounds like, you know, because, and you know, we're like, obviously it's totally crazy 
to believe that there's going to be a great flood and you need to flee to, you know, inland desert to avoid being swept up in the, you know, in a great flood. I mean, like, obviously, that's not both feet in reality. So let's continue because this is definitely not the end of it. On the 12th, Tony had what she described as a psychotic break or panic attack where he screamed and sweared at her and believed she was someone else. She later woke up that night to Tony standing over her and accusing her of being a witch. On the 16th, Tony unplugged the refrigerator. Being a witch. By the way, just I have to plug this and I'm doing this as a favor to everybody. The show The Changeling on Apple TV is absolute nuclear fire. It's so good. And you will understand why that made me think of it if you watch it. You'll love it. And turned off half the power in their house because he believed there were cameras in the refrigerator and ceiling fan and that he was being watched. He then cut the wires to the heat and air conditioning units because he believed there was a tracking device in them. And he allegedly tore the vanity mirror off the bathroom wall because he believed there was something behind it. He also took his son's food away because he believed it was poisoned. Okay, so I'm pausing there just because, like, when you're talking about fighters, especially fighters that are kind of in their, you know, late, late 30s or whatever, or guys who have taken a lot of head trauma... A lot of times I feel like people attribute anything that they do to head trauma, right? Anything that they do to head trauma, which is misplaced in many cases. I will say that head trauma will only exacerbate any kind of problem that you have with your brain, right? I, I, don't, I don't have any idea what the correlation between schizophrenia and brain damage is, but it seems, it seems uh, reasonable to assume that if you have level four schizophrenia and then you go take hellacious beatings to your brain over and over and over and over and over and you're wired like Tony, who's like energy, you know, energy, that that's probably likely to lead to increased problems with, you know, your grasp on reality. You know what I mean? So like this, does, this is not like, I just, all I mean is that if you're like a young fighter, you know, if you're a young fighter, this is not an outcome you need to concern yourself. I mean, you should definitely be concerned about head trauma just, you know, more broadly. Like, don't spar hard every day unless you're Sean Strickland and very, very good at not getting hit. But, I mean, don't spar hard. I mean, do whatever you want. But you understand what I'm saying. You're not going to become schizophrenic is my point. Um, but this actually gets scarier too. Three days later, Tony allegedly agreed to be taken for psychological help at Keck Medical Center at USC. Christina and her father went to pick him up, but when they arrived, they found much of the house destroyed. According to Christina, Tony had ripped the mantle off the wall because he believed there was a hidden doorway under the fireplace. Around this time, Christina moved into her parents' house. On March 5th, Chris Okay, so fair warning. All right, fair warning. This is where it gets gnarly, and it's like... Uh, what's the right way to put this? Like, this is super serious, this part. This is really serious. Like, and I, and I, I would never make light of a topic like this. I'm not even going to say this, actually. Here's what I'll say. People who do, are not in reality like that, potentially can hurt people and not realize that they're hurting people. Do you know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's, it can be a very dangerous situation is what I'm saying. So anyway, let's listen to this part. Christina once again picked Tony up to take him to the hospital. While they were driving on the freeway, they hit traffic, at which point Tony jumped out of the moving vehicle onto the freeway, jumped over a fence, John Jones style, before disappearing though he did later make it back to their house. The final straw came on March 7th. Earlier that day, this Christina part. said that Tony had been acting irrationally. He asked her whose car was parked outside their house and questioned if she was withdrawing money from their joint bank accounts to take their son to Italy. For the record, Christina said she is not Italian and doesn't know anybody in Italy. Later that day, Tony arrived at her parents' house where Christina was staying and allegedly asked their son if he wanted to go for a ride. Christina told Tony it was too late and he couldn't take their son. She and her mother then stood in front of Tony to prevent him from leaving, but he pushed them both out of the way. Then he ran back into the house and out the back door and over a fence with his son in his arms. 
Tony had also left his cell phone and his car behind when he ran off on foot. And to make matters worse, their son was not wearing shoes or a diaper when Tony took him, and it was raining at the time. According to Christina, she was terrified for the safety of their son. And if you listen to the 911 call she made... Okay, so that's enough. You guys get the point. And by the way, uh, I've showed you maybe three minutes, three or four minutes max of a 25-minute video. I can't stress this enough. Go watch it. Like, go watch the entire thing. It is, it is really, really good. So, needless to say, right... Oh, let me actually say this though. One, the, the where it goes next is that when they go and they, uh, you know, they find Tony and they find the kid. The kid was in was had been taken care of perfectly. Like the kid, like they found the kid. He's fed. He's chilling. Like the kid was in, you know, seemingly no danger, nothing at all. He did a like he was being a good dad with the kid when after he took him. So it wasn't like he like to you know. If, if I'm not going to show that part, I feel like that's a relevant point to you know, bring, bring attention to if I'm just going to leave it on a cliffhanger. He took care, he took really good care of the kid. So it's not like he took him and then was like throwing him into traffic or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I say someone could get hurt, I'm not talking about the kid necessarily. It's just, I mean, he is, he is one of the most dangerous human beings in the history of the world. You know, I mean, he is an instrument of destruction. He is a killing machine. And I feel like, I just, I don't know. Those of you who are, you know, have a lot of experience in martial arts definitely are excluded from this group. But people who don't, I feel like they they see a guy sliding in his career and in their minds, they don't think of them as, as formidable as they were before. And that's not true. Like, because they're not as formidable against the top point zero 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 one percent of fighters in the world right the, the, there are 15 people that are their size that can beat them in a fight now and thus their career is over okay what they can do to a civilian a regular person or just a, even a person with a lot of training like a lot of martial arts training it's you're talking about a foregone conclusion of utter violent destruction like you have, you, you could duplicate yourself three times. Well, three on one, whatever. But bottom line is, okay, if Tony goes off on someone, like if Tony thinks he's trapped or some, something happens that triggers his brain where he starts fighting, people are going to get hurt, dude. They're going to get hurt bad, real bad. And I only say that because that brings us to, this is the longest preamble ever, but I will, I'm going to timestamp this so if everybody wants to just skip to the, skip to the, you know, the fight getting made, you can. But so, which brings us to why they made this fight, right? Like, ultimately, why this is the fight that they made. And Tony's head trauma, where he's at in his career, is 100% one of the main factors for why they made this fight specifically. So, Patty Pimlet is coming off the Gordon fight where, you know, he took a he took a huge hit to his brand. He, a huge hit to his brand, right? And I like, dude, I'm on the Patty bandwagon. I I really hope that he bounces back. I think he's great for the sport. I think he's a good dude. Like he's shown to be like a good guy, you know? And we need stars. We need stars. We should all be rooting for the stars to win, right? It makes the fight it makes the fight game so much more exciting when guys with a big name are winning. It just does. I mean, if you hate a guy, then I get it, but like we should all be rooting for Patty. But he needs to win his next fight. And he needs to win. He needs to look good doing it. And Tony Ferguson has a big name, right? They know Tony's one max two fights from being done. They know that, right? So it's basically looks like this. They put Tony in there with Patty Pimlet. Okay, so if if Patty wins, then he gets that win over a big name and he gets back on the horse. It's like, you know, it's almost like a, it's almost like a, um, you know, a confidence builder, right? The other thing too is, is Patty Pimlet known as being like a super heavy striker? No. So, they're giving Tony this fight specifically because it'll be a stepping stone for Patty Pimlet and they're putting Tony at the least amount of risk of taking 
really heavy additional head trauma. The other part of it is that Tony, if he wins, then they can basically chalk it up to, I don't care how big of a star Patty is, he was never going to be anything anyway. You know what I mean? So it's like the stylistic matchup is the safest they can give for Tony. If Tony wins, then that invalidates the Patty Pimlet project anyway. I mean, the likely, I mean, I think Patty's going to win. I, I, I think Patty's going to win, but Patty will probably strangle Tony, which is crazy to say now, you know, like, can you imagine like th- that, like those words coming out of your mouth, you know, just picture where Patty Pimlet is. And then just think like four, I don't know, three, four years ago and being like, I mean, you know, it's basically a foregone conclusion that Patty Pimlet's going to strangle Tony Ferguson. It's so insane, man. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, the, the, and the, here's the other thing, dude. The UFC gets put, they're in a tough spot with guys like this, man, because, you know, what, like, what are they going to, what are they supposed to do when Tony's asking them for more fights? You know what I mean? Like, he's like, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. These guys know that Tony is, he, they, they know the same thing that we do. You know, like I would really struggle with that. I really would. If I was in, I was, if I was in uh, an executive chair at UFC, this would be my least favorite part of the business. I mean, I would hate negotiating money and stuff, but like, but this part would just, just make me heartbroken because the end of the road is tragic for 95% of fighters, right? Like when they finish, it's terrible, right? Like they didn't want to be done. You know, they they just can't do it anymore at a high level. And it's sad, dude. You know what I mean? It's like really sad because that for a handful of people, they've got opportunities and for others, they don't they don't have any idea what they're going to do. And the worst is guys like Tony who should have had it all, didn't have it, hit the end of the road looking like the, you know, back part of his life I won't even say the back half of his life the back part of his life is likely to be very rough you know and he's asking to fight and you're you feel like you owe him you you're gonna give him the fight because you feel like you owe it to him he needs the money yeah I don't know if he needs the money but like if they need the money most of the time they need the money and they're like just give me one more Dana one more I, I know what that feels like, dude. I know what the feeling is to have a family and not know what you're going to do to support them. It's paralyzing. It is absolutely paralyzing. It's a feeling I wouldn't wish on anyone. I mean, it's really like the, I mean, the worst in, in my life, the worst I've ever felt was when I was complete, like just directionless, you know, my industry that I had been in for the last six years disappeared. So I had no transferable skills and I just didn't know what the, I had no idea what I was going to do. And I was just, I I just felt like there was a, I don't know, like a weight blanket of just crushing depression on my chest, back and head all day, every day. It never went away. It was just always there until I finally got things moving again in the right direction. Speaking of which I'm taking a job. (laughs) Speaking of which, uh, taking a gig, got offered a, uh, a tech, uh, account executive gig. And I have the, I have the ability to do both this and that. And it's like, you know, the, the equation is pretty straightforward. It's like, well, I can, I can do both. So one year from now I will have this much more money. Cause I'll just basically bank. We may, you know, we're, we're good. Now. So we just bank all of that money. But man, it is going to be a big, big, big change. Because I got used, I, I got used to just doing this now, you know. But at the same time, I knew it's like, okay, this isn't really like normal that I can just go train jujitsu twice a day if I want, you know, <laughs> make a couple videos. It's like, it's beautiful and nice, but uh, unsustainable. Well, not unsustainable, just irresponsible if I have the opportunity to bring in, you know, that kind of money on the side anyway or well i mean technically that makes this my side gig again but what hey jesse remember to edit that out i will are you really going to you're pretty you know pretty on the ropes right now 
I will try to remember. Try harder. All right. Anyway, um, so if you uh, are still watching the dribble end of this uh, of this video, that means you really like the look of my jib. In that case, you should join members only where I crank out all kinds of content about things that are not uh, that are not MMA related fire stuff. And then also my live streams, I make them members only after their live. So anyway, whatever. I love you guys. If you haven't liked the video or subscribed, please do it. And I will uh, see you soon.